Hey up friends, how's it going? Happy New Year. It's Matt, you're listening to episode 67 of the Looking Sideways Action Sports podcast. It's the podcast where I try and uncover the most fascinating stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Big thanks for listening to and or downloading this one. I hope you enjoy it. I say Happy New Year, it's like the 20th of January or summer. I'm a bit late. Um, yeah, as I'll say at the end, housekeeping corner, I've had a little bit of a break from the podcast Um, but I'm back. So when I started the podcast two years ago, obviously I sat down and I wrote a big old list of people that I wanted to get on the show. Now, some of them I've been lucky enough to interview. Some of them are proper fantasy fodder, but most of them seem pretty attainable at the time. And Mickey Smith, my guest for this week's show, was one of the first names on there, actually. At the time, I thought it'd be pretty straightforward. I'm mates with Mick. We usually see each other a couple of times a year at various different things but I vastly underestimated quite how busy Mickey is these days with the result that in the end it took two years for things to align so I could finally get him on the show and well I'm pretty glad that I did as you're going to hear. Mickey has uh, generally been one of the most requested guests for the podcast. I had a feeling this one would be an illuminating and inspiring conversation and I'm happy to say that this interview is all I hoped it'd be and much, much more. So who is Mickey Smith? Well, he's a father, a photographer, a filmmaker, all-round creative force in nature, who's recently become just as acclaimed for his work as a musician, whether as part of Ben Howard's band or his own A Blaze of Feather project. He's a Cornish waterman who spent his formative years chasing heavy waves around the globe. And Mickey first came to wider prominence with the release of Dark Side of the Lens, a film he made documenting his life as part of the tight-knit scene of the west coast of Ireland, which I would say has got a claim to maybe be the most influential surf film of the last decade. Now, that is a big shout, obviously, but I'm going to kind of say it's true, really. I was recently at the London Surf Film Festival where I was looking up to see a few interviews with directors and one of them, Andrew Canada, was interviewed about his new film, He certainly made no qualms about that film's impact on him and surfing in general, and I'm inclined to agree with him, really. Anyway, the success of that film gave Mickey a huge platform, some great opportunities, but Mick being Mick, he continued to follow his own path, and as he puts it so eloquently during our conversation, the creative threads that he's followed since he was a kid and that continue to motivate him and catalyse a life of relentless creative exploration. At the same time, his background as a musician saw him... uh, hook up with Ben Howard as Ben's own career began to explode and the subsequent years have seen the boys chase their collective muse on one endless creatively honest and brave trip around the world and that topic creative bravery and honesty is really the main theme of this one I mean when was the last time you actually watched Dark Side of the Lens naturally there'll be a link in the show notes if you've not seen it but I watched it for the first time in years in preparation for this interview and it still really holds up. And what struck me is the absolute singularity and confidence of Mickey's voice and vision, which is obviously the reason it was so massively popular. And since then, everything I've seen Mickey do has confirmed the purity of this ferocious drive. And it was this that I really wanted to talk to him about during our conversation, really, uh, which we did. And it was a real privilege to speak so openly to him about the creative values and thoughtfulness that have driven his life and work and which continue to do so. If you're engaged in the creative arts yourself and are wondering where or how to start, there really are some peerless insights into the workings of an artist in this one. And this is an episode that really explores some universal artistic truths and one of the recurring overarching themes of the Looking Sideways podcast that to fully explore your own creative intentions, you really do need to dedicate yourself totally to something. This word comes up a lot, bravery. Um, in this interview and in, when I was chatting to people about Mickey and it's true you've got to be brave to do that I've been lucky enough over the years to spend time with some singular talents and it's the one thing they've all got in common and uh, yeah there's no inspiring fearlessness with which Mickey embarked upon this life himself so wholeheartedly at such a young age and has continued to follow it through I say this all the time but I'm lucky I'm very very lucky being able to participate in these conversations with some of the most inspirational people in our world and this one with a mature and true artist at the height of his expression is a particular privilege. As you can hear Mickey's got a lovely poetic turn of phrase it means the episode is sprinkled throughout 
with some beautiful images and ideas. For Mick, as he puts it, life is about following the threads of imagination and instinct, forward movement and having the courage to push through. And about how if you do that, you might be rewarded by moments of wonder and creative, honest expression. As you can probably tell, I enjoyed this one. Hope you do too. Here it is, me and Mickey Smith, Land of Wonder. Enjoy. You had a late night, right? Pretty, pretty late night. Not not as late as they get, but um, last night was quite a big gig for us, so I was pretty tired after I gave it full beans. Yeah, night two of four at Brixton. Yeah. Yeah, so how's yeah. it been? Been good? Yeah, been amazing, yeah. Um, quite the journey, actually. The um, One of the guys came in last night and showed Ben um, the like history of his gigs there and was like at Brixton yeah oh wow that's a nice thing isn't it yeah and um, yeah it's just see how how much we've done there it's amazing I've, I've left the the click on there we go get rid of that it's like, what's that noise <laughs> so how long did that span um, the first one's 2012 I think right and then after the first record presumably yeah. yeah it was about them wasn't it yeah right. during the first record touring cycle and then um we did three we did another one there on on the first record and then three um on the second record and now four on this one four on this one right yeah. so it's a good it's a good like kind of you know lifespan of the band really isn't it so you can see Obviously, it must be amazing for you because you can see how like the shows have progressed and the audience has progressed over that time. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What's the main difference that you can you can see when you think back to those early shows? Um, I guess the the sounds are constantly evolving. Ben's pushing himself all the time, um, creatively exploring. He's such a brave dude, and uh, yeah. It's just amazing to be around. I've been really lucky to be part of it. Yeah, and you were saying that your what you how did you describe it? Like a three three dimensional PA almost, like for this tour. Yeah, or for these shows. Sorry. Just for these shows. Yeah. yeah. So that's another kind of challenge, right? To to try and so how's that how's that going? Can you explain a little bit about what that actually looks like? Yeah. So um, we. Um, well Ben came up th- with the idea of it um, because it's really special to be doing these this four night residency in Brixton obviously and um, we always talk about the sound in venues we travel from place to place every day and um, just how um, and if you go to a cinema um, to watch a film the audio experience is so technical and such a massive part of what you see and obviously so much thought goes into that uh and we ben said why why aren't gigs treated like that why is it okay to just have yeah a block of sound from the front where you're looking yeah like we were sort of saying before like it kind of like just stacked and very like on the nose front of house really isn't it like the way you experience yeah exactly gig in it you know and if you kind of varies where you're in the room the quality that you hear really doesn't it yeah and you inevitably when it's across the front you have to have things kind of presented a certain way big bass to move your body yeah big drums so you feel like you can feel the band moving and and the vocals loud enough to understand before anything else is fit into that space yeah that audio space so um having this installed there with speakers around the whole room. I think there's 72 speakers or something. Right, okay. Um, and being able to spend the time. We've been in there two days before the first gig, just um, just figuring out where stuff will sit in the mix and be able to move sounds around. Like that, We're a 10-piece band for these gigs, so there's a lot of moving parts. and Yeah, right. Loads of different sounds and just amazing amount of work gone in 
to making it an experience. That's how we've approached this whole record and touring cycle, trying to make it a real experience for, for whoever's experiencing it. But yeah, and but that, that's <laughs> interesting, isn't it? Because like we were saying earlier, before we started recording, we were talking about this a little bit, and we were kind of saying that you know, as a band, traditionally you kind of do the work to make it almost like a repetition don't you and that isn't how you guys really play is it you know your set list is different every night like the way you perform is different every night and now you've added this third dimension of of complex creative complexity almost yeah so how how's it been dealing with that because presumably that's kind of exciting creatively to sort of because i mean basically it's a massive conundrum isn't it like how do you it's new territory for you like how do you kind of crack that to, to make it work in the best way right yeah, and that's that's it. I mean, I guess that's part of the whole driving force creatively with Ben is that he's constantly pushing himself to evolve and learn, and and so am I. And that's um, kind of really important, I think. Um, you know, you can't just stay doing the same thing if you're working creatively. Um, you you could just you kind of would lose where that feeling comes from if you don't if you're not able to move and change with it and push yourself to grow and follow where that spirit leads you. So, um, what do you think you lose if you if you don't have that honest like the honesty of it almost? Yeah. Um, I think that um, creativity isn't something that um, you can force, or it's you just you just offered little glimmers of it, and if you're willing to run with those those things, um, you know, it probably I probably sounds like I'm a, some kind of a hippie, but maybe I am. <laughs> um, <Yeah>, maybe <laughs> different. <laughs> I'm a big believer in energy and um, in its various shapes and forms. And when you're lucky enough to have a thread of creative energy, like move through your consciousness, I think it's important to follow that and to not question it and to just explore it. And we're lucky enough to be in the situation where we can do that. And um, and that's not to say that's an easy thing to do, like. Well, time is important for that, isn't it? Time is, you yeah. Know, like if you can dedicate time is the is almost the key thing with with any real creative project, right? Because you do need the time to immerse yourself in it, and and that's a luxury, right? Yeah, totally. But also, um, it's a luxury. But then, you know, um, all of us have spent a lot of time where we didn't have the luxury. Um, but we made sure you got there yeah well that was the question I was going to ask you actually how have you always had that view of art and creativity because you've always created since you were young right in some way so did you always you know you just like really kind of define that pretty clearly you know what it means to you and what um, and your idea of what constitutes like honest creativity is that something that you've learned or uh, did you always have that clarity from when you were younger um I think it's always been part of my thinking because um, my mother always in, encouraged me to question and and formulate my own ideas of things and think for myself and um, not just accept whatever I'm told as truth, kind of think about it and see how I feel about it and even if it's coming from her, like yeah. question back. and That's pretty brave though as well you know of her where'd she get that from um she's a teacher and she's really passionate about um kids and their own voices and how important that is for humanity to right. evolve and grow and um i guess that philosophy was directed into our own kids myself and my sister yeah yeah so you see that was kind of ingrained in you from when you were young yeah totally then you have to find your own feet with that in the world and we well, got to go through the work haven't you you got to do the do the 
like like you say follow that thread of your own creativity to kind of yeah exactly do do work that then enables you to understand it properly if you know what i mean you know explore it essentially yeah totally yeah and um uh, for a long time i would work whatever kind of jobs i could um to then fund periods of creativity or exploration or travel or whatever i felt like doing yeah but um at a certain point the creativity um became so important that i had to choose to just give it my full energy yeah um myself i remember myself and my friend rowan um having this chat because he was at the same time we must have been in our teens or something and uh we just made a pact that um instead of just doing this routine we were in of coming home working whatever job we could go away explore come back work yeah you know sh we would actually just go full in with our whatever our, we were really passionate about yeah at that time and see what happens with that and and was was that a way of because it's it's such a sort of nebulous thing this isn't it? you talk about creativity i guess what it looks like to me your what that was about was expressing yourself honestly is that w w was that what that would have looked like at that age is that kind of what you meant when you had that conversation and what you were kind of grasping at yeah and just kind of give those like because you have like you know when you, t you chat with your mates and you might you might just talk about absolute shite or you might <laughs> have a really lofty conversation about philosophy and ideas or yeah. you know wherever those conversations go and at that point we were pretty like it, we were exploring like yeah a lot of ways yeah yeah pretty like wild young dudes and um we just went all in yeah with that and um that's you know it's not easy and you have to be prepared to live with next to nothing and um give so much energy but um i've just been lucky i guess in the way things have unfolded but you had that realization at a pretty young age by the sounds of it you know that that's what it took yeah um I, and then it takes time for itself to i just knew what i really enjoyed doing i guess um and i've always just trusted the, that feeling really yeah yeah and that was the way you wanted to live your life yeah and i never would have i didn't expect to be around this long for a start at that point and then it's still why, why i'm surprised that it's still working for me why Why do you say that what why did you, that's quite a sort of big statement you know why do you um i guess i i mean it's just something you can't take for granted as something that's something I've always been aware of. Yeah, just the um, preciousness time. of it. Yeah, yeah, on this planet, in this shape, in this form. Yeah. And um, that's something I'm always conscious of. Yeah. Um, how fragile and precious and miraculous it all is, especially being a father now myself. Yeah. So you mentioned your mum, who's obviously, you know, like huge role model. And you know that that's obviously like so f important when you have those formative years isn't it like having those role models that that kind of almost teach you this way of living when you're at that age so w were there any other people in your life that that had that influence there's been um all kinds of people throughout time through my time um my when i was pretty young my mum's boyfriend at the time al um introduced me to music and by the time I was nine or ten I was in his bands on the <laughs> road playing um, playing gigs and then I was earning money doing it by by like 11 or 12. Wow what were you playing? Um, we were playing mostly kind of um, blues music, country music. Amazing. Um, in various shapes or forms. Yeah yeah um, around Cornwall between Cornwall and London yeah all oh, right so he was like a working musician yeah right right so you all oh, right so you got the glimpse of the actual reality of that life at that age then yeah it was That's quite amazing. an eye-opener 
for me. Yeah, no doubt. At that point. It's fucking young though, isn't it? Jesus. Look, like my nephew's eight, so thinking about that. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> it's like, wow, okay. So what and what were you playing like guitar and drums then? Um, guitar, bass and drums in right. depending which the band was shape shift a lot depending on which musicians were available and what the gig was and Right. Um So you were on the road at that age? Yeah, it was um that's brilliant. He used to have this little blue Ford van and th- we'd load the gear in the back and then he'd just slot me in on top of the speakers just lying down in the back and off we go. He sounds like a legend. Yeah, he's a complete legend. Um, it totally changed the way I saw things and understood the uh, the concept of work. And yeah, uh, right. You di- it didn't have to be kind of like go yeah. get a job at fucking wherever Sainsbury's you yeah know, Marks and Spencer's whatever it is like just going totally. there's a bigger world out there it's a big Especially theme big theme of these chats actually that that, that that you get that glimpse of like oh I don't have to settle for this you know yeah and I mean there's nothing wrong with that um, it's just whatever works for you personally um, but coming from a, a place like West Cornwall and growing up um a lot of the kind of work options it's but i mean i can't speak for kids now but um when i was a kid at that point in in west cornwall your job prospects were um work in tesco work in a restaurant yeah or you know scrub dishes or sure. work on a fishing boat yeah and uh that's it really yeah so um i mean and that was fine that was my idea of work or yeah you know become a teacher like my mum or something but um to be able to then go out play music which i love doing and then start getting paid for it totally flipped that on its head for me right um at quite a young age yeah Yeah. because i mean and you know all the i guess at the same time your environment that you grew up in like another massive influence right yeah totally yeah yeah where were you where were you brought up um I grew up in Newlyn and then we moved to Penzance when I was seven or eight. Right. Yeah. So you were just in the sea? Yeah, it's just um amazing part of the world to grow up in, really. Totally lucky. And I've just moved back there two years ago and I appreciate it so much. Um inevitably when you grow up somewhere you kind of have a different idea of it and um you try and get away from that and yeah. then you come back well i have personally anyway yeah come back and really see it with totally different eyes and it's such a like land of wonder it's an incredible place to be and to bring my own kids up there yeah i feel really lucky what was it that precipitated the move back did you, you just the, the change of understanding that you had about it um, no, we've, we've been living in Ireland for 10 or 11 years, myself and my partner, Rivi, and... Uh, yeah, you're out near the Hinch, right? Yeah, and we were, like, we bought a house and we were the most, having the most amazing life there, but with our, our, by the time we had our second child and I was away touring so much, um, it made sense to be closer to family. Yeah, you need that support, don't you? Yeah. And it just felt like a nice, a nice time to kind of change the energy, and that felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's a good stint, isn't it, to live in one place and kind of get to the end of a cycle and be like, yeah, okay, time to time to change it, get back. And did you always just think Cornwall was the place? Because obviously you've travelled a shitload, you know. Yeah. It was always like, what well, we're going to go home, sort of thing. Um, there were conversations of other places but um i think we both missed our family and like losing my sister and um losing al and things like that have all been um kind of instrumental in me wanting to be close to my family for a long time yeah i i was um quite happy to be self-absorbed and right um I th- just made me realise how important those connections are yeah. in your family. What the sort of grief process was yeah. something that clarified that for you. Yeah, massively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. That's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, you 
I imagine spent a large part of your life digesting that, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. It's um. I guess everyone's got their own ideas ideas of life and death and um, how you feel about it. Um, but we all have to face it at some point in in everyone's life. Well, everyone ignores it, don't they? Yeah. Like especially when you're our age. I think it's only. I mean, I'm early forties. It's only now that actually. You, you're like, all oh, right, this is just this thing that no one talks about, <laughs> which is a really new thing as well, isn't it? Yeah. I think, I think obviously, probably up until the last hundred years, every, it was just such a fact of life. Yeah. And, and you know, how we live, it's just like, you pretend it's not going to happen, don't you? Yeah, totally. Unless something like you lose a close family member or friend and then you've, you, you've got to face it. And I don't know if we have the tools really, do we? Emotionally. Yeah, it's a, that's the big question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I st- I thought that I did, but um, I totally didn't. You thought that you had the tools. You thought you understood it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't pretend to understand it at all now, but um, at least I have experience of it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, the cherry older sister. Um. Cherry's my younger sister, but right. she was always like my older yeah. sister. Yeah, c- the way you talk about her is almost like that relationship, almost because I've got an older sister. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's quite. A, I think you know brother sister relationship. It's obviously very particular, anyway. But yeah, um, so presumably she was another huge influence for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, um, she always looked after me and always encouraged me and. Um, just massive influence on giving me belief in being able to do um, whatever I was doing and that it had any value or worth really? at all, yeah. So she backed you? Yeah, yeah. totally. Which yeah. is another thing that you need, isn't it? Especially when you're making decisions in your late teens, early 20s that you're going to follow, like an unconventional path, isn't it? Yeah, totally. You know, you do need somebody that, that you trust to say, like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, it'll be right. it's just... It's all good. Yeah. 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 So when, at that point, the, you, was this when you started to broaden it? Is this when you started to think about, you know, because obviously your relationship with Ireland you've mentioned, and is that yeah. around the time that that sort of started, that you, like, kind of late, late teens, sort of early? I've been going, I'd spent a lot of time um, travelling to Ireland already since I think I first went there when I was 14. Right. Um on a swell with some friends they pile I was walking to school and I've heard you tell that yeah they like piled you in the van that's right yeah (laughs) and took me that's that's brilliant oh yeah I was lucky to have mates like that yeah Um, and and another eye opener yeah and they were an amazing crew actually growing up as well the boys in West Cornwall were really free thinking um, wild individuals big influence on me Who, who would who would that be then who who um, who'd you look up to out of that scene? There's quite a um a lot of names, but there's probably like twenty of us as as um kids growing up and I was kind of young maybe the youngest of that that scene. Right. Uh, that we had anyway. Yeah. Or one of the younger um Jack Johns was probably the youngest actually. And um and Dan's Dan and Piran Skoroski. Yeah. But um, obviously there's loads of different names. Sure, it's yeah. It's difficult to go into. Like yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Names of people, but they, that spirit, um, all of those guys had, especially the older guys who uh, I really looked up to and who like looked out for me and took me surfing, and, um, just kind of inspired me in a lot of ways. It's amazing to have those older role models. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, again, it y- they, they they guide you, don't they? They give you the almost like the permission in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, because a lot of it is about that as well, isn't it? It's like kind of seeing that somebody's just a little bit further down the path than you are, and you can you can kind of ah oh, okay, so that is acceptable, and you know I can follow what I want to do, and yeah, perhaps totally. there's a future in it, kind of thing. Yeah, and they you know they're just being just wild surf rats and <laughs> just we just used 
all used to have mopeds and would would um, burn around together t- trying to find heavy <laughs> waves on the coast of Cornwall. That's what we were just obsessed with heavy waves, and that's where we ended up going to Ireland on that first swell run because we'd seen Litmus had just come out and we'd seen this left um, in that video Joel Fitzgerald and John Frank shooting and uh, just um, blew our minds such a seminal film isn't it yeah it really is the impact of it is massive yeah huge yeah it was fucking massive for us and well for me anyway I mean I can't talk for everyone I think I think generation really yeah. especially in the UK I mean I think it's it, anyone you speak to of our age it's, it's it's that big isn't it you know it's like it's huge yeah totally yeah so that was the catalyst that's what sent you over there yeah just realised like like I said we were just obsessed with heavy waves and the, f- the energy involved in that and the feeling of it was something that really captured us and the seeing waves like we we heard about in Australia and yeah. places like that I'm really close to where we live yeah. just completely blew our minds so I started going there all the time really yeah and it was the feeling that of and presumably like the exploration as well and the adventure of, of trying to discover yeah was that something that was driving you from from that age as well um yeah I think when you yeah it's always a spirit of adventure yeah, those guys were always pretty instrumental in that. I, I think being in West Cornwall too is just, and being interested in heavy waves, there's not that many options. So you have to be pretty creative in your outlook. We spent yeah. hours hiking and Got walking. And, yeah. yeah. Just trying to find, those, follow those threads yeah. of like imagination and yeah, yeah. instinct. And that developed a lot of things for me. Is this about the time that you started shooting as well then? I was always shooting. My mum gave me a camera when I was maybe like nine or ten. Right. My first disposable camera anyway. Um, and I just used to buy these little, I don't know if you remember, you could go to um, Boots or something and buy a, a little waterproof 36 yeah, yeah. shot camera. Yeah, we used to take them out like snowboarding. Same yeah. thing, you know. And then you never knew what was on them, did you? No. And then you develop them, you'd be like, all oh, right. Yeah, it's the quite quite nice, the random aspects of it like that as well. Yeah, and you make them last, like, months, yeah. like that roll of 36. And yeah. Um, that was my introduction to self-photography, really. And then seeing John Frank stuff in Litmus really, like, made me... And obviously the surf and bodyboarding magazines at, at that point, water shots really captured my imagination of heavy waves yeah and i was just interested in that as an art form really yeah um well, it sounds like it was probably a good sort of culmination of you know the th- the, th- the thoughts that you were having you know like um, the direction your life's going the creativity like all these threads yeah kind of like maybe the first expression of that you know what i mean yeah, like when yeah. you could actually like have an end product almost and 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 work on it and yeah yeah is that kind of and were you filming as well at this point yeah we'd started um myself and my friend um had like started exploring using video cameras and making our own little home movies of skating and surfing just for the boys and girls to just kind of laugh at and mostly for our own entertainment really yeah uh putting music to them and it was fun using two vhs's and recording doing the like yeah yeah editing like that yeah and primitive style shooting super eight and high eight and eventually dv and then yeah makes you be creative though don't those restrictions as well when you think back yeah you know, like having a disposable camera or having two vcls or whatever yeah and you and have to work around it don't you almost wasn't aware of any that blew my mind anyway yeah just being able to take a photograph or shoot something yeah uh document one of the experiences we were having yeah uh there's always a wonder with that and i'm always quite detached in any environment uh i find myself sitting back quite a lot so it's a natural kind of 
and a way to express myself observationally yeah right because you imposing it on anyone you feel observing and capturing is almost a bit more of a way of expressing yourself naturally yeah and um i i kind of like there's a couple of lines about that in dark side of the lens actually isn't there that you kind of say that, that almost nods to that maybe yeah um i can't actually remember the the words at this point but um I should imagine so. Yeah, <laughs> ah, there'll be a link. <laughs> there'll be a link to it. Um, but yeah, like it's interesting because, uh, you know, what you said you feel more comfortable, as in, what like socially or just expressively? How do you mean by that? Yeah, um, socially, and also just, um, it's a natural. At some point in a, any situation, I'll find myself just wherever I am. And I'll be trying to like appreciate it, right? And just, oh, this is cool. Or, <laughs> this isn't cool, right? Actually, just be present. Yeah, and that, um, that gives you the, the, the a way of doing it, right? Like a lens to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just yeah, like like the idea of having memories. I'm quite forgetful, so right. Um, it helps me having something i can like remember oh, I, I i was actually at this place at this point and yeah it's not just an um, something i'm imagining right a lot of the time i'm not sure whether i'm imagining any of this yeah i've been talking to you right now yeah yeah no it's funny though isn't it because memory's like it's so light that like it's it's a, it's a trick sometimes isn't it i i completely have that you know sometimes especially with stories as well especially with stories that you tell because you accumulate these layers and interpretations of stories don't you especially like when you've got like a group of friends or whatever yeah do you know what i mean and you you must have it as well and you you, you tell the stories and then i've had that where i've been like did that actually happen yeah or is it now just the thing like a, a thing that we're talking about yeah and, you, and no one can actually remember can they you know it's like or you're like oh someone will say something you're like well that didn't happen you know like it it's just so unreliable basically yeah <laughs> totally yeah but people t sort of stand and fall on it don't they you know like right so you always you always had that it, it had a practical use almost yeah <laughs> it was like a way of saying this actually happened yeah um, scars are like that though, aren't they as well they are yeah yeah totally you know scars you you, you know it happened yeah and tattoos tattoos and um yeah photographs yeah yeah <laughs> physical remembrances though. yeah yeah god there's a lot of them around these days jesus <laughs> yeah right okay so you again it, it's interesting there's a lot of layers to it so you you know you you kind of developing it expressing it capturing it yeah so is this you're mainly based around ireland at this point or are you traveling because you, you um, you've obviously done time in like ours haven't you and yeah all over like most um some of the most influential times uh, for me um creating image and moving image uh was um exploring for heavy waves in australia and some of the characters and um people i ended up meeting there and Is that where you met wilbert yes where yeah. i met wilbert yeah 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 Gotta and all of the characters in that scene that he's from um they're like massively inspirational people for me at that point in time yeah they're still such wild creative dudes doing amazing work in whatever shape or form yeah um and what took what took you over there just heavy waves and yeah just idea. exploring just let's get get over there Adventure, see what it is yeah new horizons um, never intended to stay there very long, but um, one thing led to another, and following those threads of yeah. energy and saying why not? Yeah. Was, okay, fuck it. Let's <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, see how it pans out. Ended up after a long time traveling around, uh, working in Margaret River, and I had a pretty um, kind of nice job where I could get up early into the water 
um, amazing waves. And when the time the wind went on, she would have to go to work about 10 or something. Right. Work like five or six hours and then maybe in for the evening where the, the light's getting incredible. And I just started really just enjoying documenting that. It was a re- really good... I haven't had many times in my life where I've had a routine. Um, and that was like an amazing rhythm for me. Okay. Um, just like exploring. I could surf or shoot or just spending time in the water and then work scrubbing toilets or whatever I was doing um, and then go back in the evening and if I was more peaceful I'd just shoot and yeah just learning a lot yeah. learning from the guys surfing bodyboarding there um, shooting in the water they, they all taught me so much um, and the sea did as well yeah sure about myself like pushing myself challenging myself yeah what I could or couldn't handle. Yeah. And then those characters help you through that journey. Took me to experiences I would never have imagined having as a kid in in West Cornwall, you know. And that kind of prepared me for what was to come in Ireland in the later years kind of thing. Yeah, right. All of that stuff. Yeah. Just hours and hours and hours in heavy waves. Right, of, of, of time put in. An experience yeah. gained, and no reason for it other than I just fucking love doing it. Yeah, amazing. So, how long did that last? Um, probably like three or four years. Okay, so it's a good stint then. Yeah, on and off, and traveling to other places, Iceland and Hawaii and um, Canary Islands, places with heavy waves. Yeah, sure. That yeah. I could kind of afford to go to. And figure out ways of working when I was there or whatever. Yeah, were you starting to sell shots and stuff at this point? At some point in there, um, different people were approaching me for mostly the odd photograph and mostly footage, like right. stuff that I was filming. Yeah. And uh, stuff started showing up in surf and bodyboard films mainly. Bodyboarding was my kind of world. Yeah. And all of those characters are just such like passionate creative crazy people amazing amazing individuals it's just such a it's a scene unto itself in that there's no money in it so it just takes any of the bullshit away um anyone who's doing it is passionate and it's just self-exploration um they don't have any other motivation. There's no agenda. So like... It's just for its own sake. They're just proper humans pushing the limits. Yeah. It's amazing to be around. Yeah. Some, is that uh, something that you've also sought out then? Um, I don't know if I did it purposefully. Yeah, yeah. Just, you just kind of gravitate to... Yeah. Like I was talking about energy, I just... I've always ended up with people who on a similar frequency maybe just because i gravitate to that yeah sure not because i've sought it out particularly yeah i'm not very good at walking up to someone and saying hi yeah you know let's do this yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah well that was i I said i spoke to shambles last night and that was one of the things that he was so nostalgic about that that island scene when you boys all kind of were you know together which is, I guess, is probably a little bit after this Western Australia period that you're talking about, and he's just saying the same thing. It's like a unrepeatable kind of community, community and experience almost. Yeah. And the, he, that's what he was saying as well. Is like the purity of it. Yeah, he and that's the thing he was really like. You got to ask him about that, you know, because that that he was, yeah, very very grateful for those times. I would say from what he was saying. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, massive. It's it's hard to uh, put it into any kind of context, really, because it's such a like expanse of my life, and so many different shapes or forms. Yeah. But that was where you started spending more and more time as it as it as it went on. Yeah, and my friend Nick Lawrence in Western Australia ended up becoming the editor of a magazine. 
and we were really tight and he just started working with me as a photographer oh, nice. a lot and i've been making films and giving people footage and whatever exploring that those possibilities and seeing how, how that worked and um just enjoying like starting to get get paid to do the things i was enjoying um but not really seeking it and then nick just kind of like you said just said you can do this let's 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 gave you the nudge gave you the next nudge and also the characters i was traveling with at that point um people like brendan newton and those kind of people really believed in me too yeah and i believed in them and we just spent time together and that that kind of grew like my friendship with steph skyroski um at that point we were exploring the same places and we were going to Ireland a lot together and that's when we first started surfing the heavy waves like Bumbleoys and things like that. Yeah. Or when, when we met Shambles and yeah, yeah. those people. And Jack was around when he was well. Yeah. yeah. Jack was really young. He's like 16 or something. Yeah. yeah. Another one asked to come in here and said no. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, no, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So is this when you started sort of seeing the waves that you know now obviously very famous yeah yeah t- totally um yeah just and we're just f- just enjoying that moment in time completely captivated and enamored with it and the feeling in the water and between the guys we were with and we just pushing ourselves and learning and growing pretty pretty incredible moment as a someone growing up this was the time when you were also like ferg and, and tom would have been on the scene as well then right yeah um kind of like a few years after all of those initial early explorations for us um ferg and tom um kind of were coming up as young surfers and started appearing the heavy waves in Ireland and um they were just the energy about them was really kind of similar to where I was at and completely enraptured with that feeling in the water and yeah the excitement of it and the kind of isolation and adventure at that point in time kindred spirits yeah, yeah. just we just connected like massively and but you didn't know Tom from Cornwall I knew Tom in Cornwall, but not as like a close friend. Yeah. Um, until that point where we were together in Ireland, um, and me and my partner Rivi were living there, and um, she'd said to me, "Let's let's go and do this. Let's let's just be where where you want to be and be together." And she really believed in me, and and um, and that kind of feeling that I had that I wanted to spend time there, and. Um, and Tom appeared and then Ferg appeared and all of a sudden there's just um, a proper like movement of energy, a big shift for us happening where we just every day had purpose, like let's find the most kind of intense situations we can <laughs> in the water and just like enjoy it and, yeah. and see what happens. And like it was an, a really special time for me and and then uh, I think all of us who were around at that point in time, that that little scene yeah. of friends, like the bodyboarders and Rivi, and we had like so many people staying in our house, like who would come down down the coast from up North Shambles or from Dublin, or where the boys would come over, people coming in from Australia or America to stay with us, friends from the past, and yeah. these still on these kind of exploratory missions and it's just incredible yeah yeah the energy that feeling um some that's something i'll never forget that feeling yeah from that point in time and uh, you know I, I know you've talked about dark side lens a shitload and i know that you kind of made it as a way of explaining you've said before to, to cherry about what you did but does when you look back at that now does that kind of capture it that moment in time yeah 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 totally that's that is exactly where we're at we're totally being honest with ourselves and 
just like just kind of giving ourselves to that moment um we knew that it's it's not f a f a finite it was a finite thing yeah so um it was just incredible and like having the belief of people like my sister and the boys and my partner Rivi and just people around you who are saying it's okay to like just be completely involved in this moment for no reason other than it's a beautiful thing that's powerful you know yeah right yeah did, did you did you think did you kind of did you did you, were you conscious of it because I was like you, you know earlier you said like you try to be really present and conscious of, of what's unfolding as it happens like with, did you have that kind of clarity of it did you did you kind of think like this is like you know this is a special time kind of thing yeah especially in those early years I I was um I was starting to become pretty like completely absorbed in that um and it just meant so much to me to be able to do that and uh yeah, I was definitely conscious that it wasn't going to last, maybe, and I was just, let's just enjoy it, boys. Yeah, the golden years. Yeah, and like they said, you know, how long are going to be around from? We we lost people, we lost brothers, you know, people we were close to, and, yeah, you know, shit happens, and that stuff's precious. Yeah. Yeah. All of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, I try and be better at that, to sort of, yeah, be present enough to say, should you really make a note of this? This is <laughs> it's kind of a kind of a good time. Might not happen again, you know. Yeah. Because you can take those things for granted very easily, can't you? Totally. Especially like we tour in constantly the last five or six years or something, playing music every day. It's such an incredible experience because it's it's there's so much to take in every day, constantly doing the routine of the same things in a different place but it's always a new experience you really have to make sure at some point you sit back and just take a breath and go fucking hell <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is happening yeah here we are again fourth night at Brixton yeah, yeah exactly I mean those things are fucking amazing yeah and yeah that's lucky bastards yeah but like you say it's not like you woke up with your your synth module at the end of your bed is it like <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> like you you've, you've worked hard for it yeah. well you know you've 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 been on a path that's led here let's put it that way yeah, yeah. and you do like uh, i didn't um all of that stuff the concept of work is always like it's supposed to be painful and uh a shit thing yeah and uh sometimes there is that and there's so much, especially with creative work, there's so much self-doubt and, like... Guilt. When you're battling with something, you're trying to make what you can see or feel and you you can't... or hear and you can't get there. That is... Like, it seems so far away. And that void is so tough to push yourself through and keep following that thread and not completely destroy it by self-doubt and self-criticism and worrying what other people think and say and um your mind plays such tricks on you and everyone struggles with those questions no matter what you do yeah it's creatively or just getting up in the morning yeah like, yeah um and that's one thing like all of this stuff has taught me is always like light if you can just keep pushing through that stuff um so yeah in that sense i have worked yeah fucking hard for it but yeah. but it's more of an internal battle than like you know i'm not digging holes every day at this point but i have been in you've the past. done that can you get better at that do you get did you have you got better at that like banishing those no in a, in a you know those i mean demons inner voices whatever you want to call it like that you know th th that 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 voice of self-doubt which tells you that you're not good enough and it's shit and you know that you you should give up and you know can you like say everyone's got it yeah I, I often think people who are successful creatively have just learned to i've got better at ignoring it basically yeah. 
you know is that something that you found um i just i struggle always but um and with my mental health and um all kinds of stuff but um the one thing that's helped me has been able to take a step back and appreciate that that um that total like expanding of perspective uh, perspective and being able to see things from a different point of view is such something I really feel lucky to have so it always helps me flip it on its head right and just step the fuck out of my head and just kind of um yeah appreciate you know yeah and is creativity like a helpful outlet for that as well like having the focus of of a project that you can try and see through and express yourself in that way totally yeah i mean that is massively part of my um kind of reason for still being you know yeah just being able to follow those threads and be full of energy and energized by it yeah and wrestle with it and like yeah i kind of look forward to those battles in some way with myself and whatever other challenges might be yeah you know it's it's hard to be aware of it though, isn't it? That's what's so fascinating about what you're saying because I've never even thought of it like enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm aware of it, but I've never thought about it as like an enjoy. And, and I know you're not saying that. I'm just I'm just saying like you know the perspective of it is what we're talking about, right? And how you how you handle it. One of a couple of things on this point that you've said since we've been talking today. You talk about art and creativity as like you have the picture is is that is that is that true for most of the projects that you have like the creative things do you, do you have you got a, something you try to attain something that you try to match to what's in your head it's yeah a feeling um it's some a feeling is more what i would identify with anything okay um, right to capture that yeah right like an expression um, i mean you you must know as humans we all connect to something that makes us feel something yeah something that's re- makes us feel either like uplifted or like woof that's heavy or yeah wow that's incredible or just it makes you feel something yeah that you respond to or i identify with that feeling that you know like i i look for that and there's something in me for my own personal stuff that i can if the feelings there i know that's kind of that's right for me yeah you know i just try and trust it um it's not easy but it's that's something i've got to go on yeah and have you ever succeeded yeah i mean in a way that you know that you feel is success one thing i've learned over time is that um it's never you know that feeling is the same but what you visualize is not at the start is never how you end up yeah and that's okay yeah well that's another thing you gotta learn right totally yeah as you as you as you get experience and and you try things and it used to drive me mental and like i used to have i've literally still got a filing cabinet full of 35 mil slides and rolls of film called fuel for the fire where i was (laughs) just fuck up the most incredible shit yeah i would be seeing and be so like devastated with myself right because but it didn't match what you were trying to yeah right and I just fucked it up right but um you've learned i was that, learning yeah you know and that's okay maybe, at that well, point that the was point. the biggest disaster <laughs> for me yeah but i kept all that stuff and i would revisit and try and learn from it and i think that's important but I, you know i often think that accepting that is what gives you the freedom um and it and is is the point almost totally yeah because it because when because in a way when you were putting those effectively like shackles on yourself then you, you you're shackling what's going to come out aren't you because yeah. you're inhibiting it you're, you're saying like it's almost like a f- false form of creativity in a way because you're it's a bit contrived you know what i mean like yeah. and it's when you it's when you kind of like accept that the point is just doing it and, and then like you say try to capture it and seeing what you can can get out of the end of it yeah personally anyway that almost like freedom has come yeah and, and and you know a bit of liberation from it really yeah and realizing that it's a gift and that thread doesn't come from you it's some kind of form of energy 
it's like moving through your consciousness and if you if you spot it and you glimpse it and you run with it that's a gift and um that's the magic of it yeah i think of being human and being able to see that stuff and like you know being lucky enough to have the tools to do it is incredible yeah and the outlets you yeah. know whether it's like working out you know PA you know I mean that's what it is isn't it as well yeah. you know I mean that's the same the same thing like how you express it in those different outlets so yeah, what totally. have you obviously you, 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 you the tour's coming to an end right like pretty soon yeah You've got a few shows left yeah we have another week next week yeah so what what's next on this tip you know because you obviously at the end of a bit of a phase so what have you got coming um just get stuck in keep following the threads that have been coming my way on this tour um i've spent a lot of time in hotel rooms or on the bus just in my own world creating sounds and exploring that learning a lot with modular synths and things and i'm just gonna put in some time with that obviously being a father i've, I've got two kids and i have to pay the bills and things like that that weighs on on what, how you explore creative work and what options you take up, but um, I always try and prioritise the things I I kind of feel passionate about or I feel an in inclination to that follow that feeling, you know. Yeah. And are you are you still shooting? Yeah, shooting all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, see on the road a lot. I'm not shooting in the water. My water time is mostly swimming these days in oh, the really? sea. Yeah. Nice. Um, surfing when I can and when I feel like there's enough time for it. Yeah. Um, but um, a lot of the time I'll be on the coast with my kids and I want to spend time with them and yeah, I get the same release of energy I get through surfing being with them. Yeah. It's um, It's like a peace of mind thing yeah for me riding waves um so i just dive in the sea because the physical act of that um is f like i've realized how important that is for me it um there's something about it yeah i don't know what what it is but um it's transformative isn't it it's on, just on a, on a lot of d even if you just throw yourself in and get out again. yeah <laughs> it does something doesn't it just makes you feel better and yeah feel good and like able to flip stuff on its head easier and yeah just yeah i wonder what it is it's got to be some physical reaction that's going on that affects your mental state because it yeah. does i mean i try and get in the sea you know whenever i can really like whether it's same as like what you're saying whether it's just like jump in go for a swim go for a surf like whatever um and it definitely does something. Yeah, totally. I've learned to just know as like a, yeah, I can just do that and it'll it'll change something. Yeah. Know. Yeah, totally. Salt water. It's really powerful, powerful stuff. Yeah. Don't know why, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna you've got a studio. You were saying. Yeah, it's more of a shed, but it, it's a it's a creative space. A for space, me. a place. Yeah, it's wicked. Um, That's amazing yeah that must be nice yeah it's so important so just even if it's a little corner of wherever you live or just have your own little zone where you can just get lost in your stuff even if it's for a couple hours in the evening or whatever just yeah makes a big difference yeah yeah and so t we're gonna see the show tonight right so like you've got tonight and tomorrow left you were saying yeah that's right isn't it two out of four yeah. last night yeah right um yeah i'm looking forward to it like i said i think it's six or seven years since i've seen you boys yeah right yeah um, yeah so what and you it is going to be different than last night then oh it kind of is every night and yeah. that's that is an energy thing more than anything yeah um just how between between all of you as, as yeah. a group like do you just kind of yeah and we spark things with each other the first night the sounds were really beautiful and expansive and last night we were more intense and full of fire and um, it's just a different journey every day. It's incredible to play music like that. It depends so instinctive and 
we run with that feeling wherever he's going. Right. Um, it's pretty rare to see musicians doing that. Everything's so formulaic and like everyone's trying to make everything the same so they can produce exactly the same thing every night without question. Yeah. Take out all the questions. And he is constantly pushing himself. And I love being around that. Yeah, well, again, that's the you've all as a group earned the right to do that haven't you almost by the time and the the trust almost I guess of like working together for that long and and being this creatively open with each other which must be a pretty nice feeling I imagine right yeah yeah totally it, I mean it's nothing but a blessing it's not to say that it's not difficult and um, especially for for someone like Ben who is expected to be a performer constantly yeah um, and um he's just like doing the most incredible guitar work for a start you're ever ever gonna hear s someone play yeah he's pretty fucking underrated actually just <laughs> mind-blowing every player, day isn't he? for me he fucking blows my mind yeah at some point in the set i'll just look up and go what the actual fuck <laughs> and um he's incredible and like that's just one aspect of what he does yeah as a singer and wears his heart on his sleeve and just pours everything in to what he's doing and like just because he's standing there and not running around like Mick Jagger gyrating and stuff like <laughs> does not mean he's not doing something fucking incredible every night and yeah you know that expectation what people want to see as an audience and you know it's like I love how he challenges that. Yeah. And this... Doesn't conform to yeah. to what's expected. He's just honest to himself and yeah. what he what he's trying to do. Yeah. It's fucking brave. Yeah. How did you find the transition from, from when you did A Blaze of Feather, like to being the front man? Was that something... Because, you know, you just mentioned, like, there's the, 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 that expectation about being a performer and, and it's a role, isn't it, basically, that you kind of meant to inhabit, really? You yeah. Know? How how is because obviously that's a pretty big shift of perspective for you, isn't it? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean that all all was really um completely unplanned and, and totally instinctive and the whole sort of record. And yeah, yeah, I mean I write all the time. Yeah. it's an outlet for me. Uh, writing words and melodies and songs the whole time through since being a kid yeah there's years of stuff written um for no reason other than that than that and um just at that point in time or whatever i was exploring at that point we were playing as a band because ben was just taking some time yeah and uh it just one thing led to another and and him and owen said look this is fucking cool why don't we record it and i just it just blew my mind that that they were up for that yeah and uh it's just a f such a gift um from all the band really yeah because it's it's not as well isn't it and india yeah. and like a lot of the same people right yeah and me and nat go so far back musically he's a, together he's a legend that man he is an absolute legend yeah he's a hero that dude um one of the most incredible musicians you'll ever meet yeah he's got some tales hasn't he and we um he's another one I should probably get on there actually you should the right chat on him honey. yeah if you ever need some rock and roll stories <laughs> yeah because he's got that whole like Manchester backstory hasn't he yeah and and I spent a lot of time with him there musically and yeah and bands and um we grew up together and so they're having that connection way back and then just being able to do that this kind of stuff together now is yeah, you could a, never have written it as kids. That's a joy in it, that. It's just mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. All of us, Richie, grew up in West Cornwall too, and we just every night we we're looking at each other like, "How the fuck do we end up here?" Yeah, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it, man. Well, we better get you, get your showwards. <laughs> yeah, that's been amazing, man. Nice one, mate. So there you go, that was my interview with Mickey. I hope you enjoyed it. I was lucky enough to spend that evening with Mickey and the boys and uh, I saw the show that night, night two of four at Brixton. 
and yeah, really amazing what this group of creatively driven friends have achieved. Uh, you know, I can't claim to be really close friends with them, but I've been around that scene quite a lot over the years and it's just amazing to see how well they've done and I really look forward to seeing where the journey takes them in the future. So yeah, housekeeping corner, as I said at the top and as you might have noticed, I had a little bit of time off from the podcast last few weeks. I mean, to be honest, I just actually ran out of episodes. I did have a brief panic about it temporarily, particularly when I was in France over Christmas. And then I had a moment of clarity, really, which was, who cares, actually? I mean, the whole thing was supposed to be a bit of a laugh in the beginning, which it still is, obviously. And the whole reason I started it was just so that I had a bit of a journalistic slash creative outlet myself finding stories that I found interesting it was never meant to be a job or something that I got stressed about so I thought you know what fuck it I'll just calm down enjoy a few weeks off from the podcast get on with get on with my life for a little bit and then kick things off once I've got a few guests lined up again which is how it's panned out I'm glad I did to be honest because it looks like it's about to get really fucking busy with a lot of new guests if things carry on as it looks like they will much of it is linked to the traveling I'm going to be doing. It's winter. I'm always pretty busy in winter um, this time of year. I've got ISPO coming up. It's a big European action sports trade show. I've got a trip to Innsbruck. I'm going to Norway. I've got three weeks in California. I've been invited to Portugal. Um, I've got some pretty exciting stuff going on by the looks of it in 2019. Pretty happy about that. In another pretty hilarious development, I also got trolled for the first time ever. Which I must say was actually really funny. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll probably have seen I'm at We Look Sideways, incidentally, if you want to go over. You'll probably see that I tend to share the messages I get on Instagram stories. Uh, Happily these days, a lot of people get in touch to chat about the show, give me feedback. Or they just seem to want to have a bit of a chat, which is fine by me. Uh, Anyway, I tend to post them on Instagram stories every now and again. When I remember, I also post up pick some videos from my travels uh, and it was that which piqued the interest of one Instagrammer who sent me a right old stinging message accusing me of wanting to make a name for myself as a public figure which is obviously absolutely hilarious so if you're listening mate of course it was a bloke thanks for giving me the biggest laugh I've had in ages um, because you know that is just it's just funny isn't it you know What else is going on? I was interviewed about the podcast by my friends over at the Surf Simply website, which was nice. They went pretty in-depth on my background, how I ended up doing this, uh, my uh, um, methodology, I guess you could say, and all the rest of it. Big thanks to Kim and Matt for that one. Not sure when that's going to be posted, but to make sure you don't miss it, then you might want to segue. Sign up for my weekly newsletter. Uh, Yeah. That just happened uh, once a week, usually on a Friday, but sometimes on a Sunday, if I don't have time to do it on a Friday, I send out my newsletter, which has the five things from the world of action sports that I think are worth sharing each week. Could be absolutely anything. It's going down pretty pretty well with a growing army of weekly readers, that one. Speaking of newsletters, anyone who sends one out, I mean, I'm not alone, right? You immediately go and check to see who's unsubscribed, right? I mean, yeah, it's a weirdly compelling and masochistic exercise especially when you see one of your mates unsubscribe blissfully unaware that you can see that they've done it but everyone does that right i mean what a world weird one but yeah that's me anyway elsewhere i've been asked to do a live show at ispo actually a very interesting sounding live show at ispo Uh, i'm not sure we're confirmed yet so i'm not going to say who it involves or what is going on there um, because I've got a feeling we're, we're still a bit cloak and dagger right now. But I'll be posting about that on my social media if it happens. So head on over to my website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. You're going to find my social accounts there and, of course, all the show notes from this episode and every other episode that I've ever done. So there you go. All right, that's it. Nice one. Big thanks to Mickey for coming on the show, to all of you lot for checking this one out and your continued loyalty to the podcast. I'll be back soon with the next episode. In the meantime, enjoy your week. I'll catch you next time. Nice one. (laughs) 